own immediate family. And uh, they're saved. And my oldest brother, bless your heart, he's one of the finest personal soul winners that you would ever in, in the world want to make. And uh, yet they are involved in a ministry that in the last two times that I have been with them, this has been what they've stated to me. And I haven't asked for it, but I, you know, how we are sometimes, especially with family, we, we kind of find out things that, without them knowing <laughs> that you are finding out things. And um, uh, so, as I was talking to Charlie and Helen, my, this has been Helen's response. Oh, listen, uh, we, we have a tremendous ministry back there where we're living in California. The activity that we have, and my, as I was singing, I love activity and I love singing and all of this too. But the emphasis is on a program which involves all of these things. And um, uh, it's growing by virtue of uh, program. And uh, when they hear me preach, they hear me teach, uh, I get uh, sort of down to the nitty gritty many times when my family's present. And uh, uh, that's pretty, pretty straight, isn't it? Yes. But isn't that what the Bible says? Yes. Listen. By virtue of our response, we are testifying as to the spiritual condition of our life. It may be we're not even saved, even though we've given a lot of consent and admission. But I'll listen. Isn't this second response? Either the spiritual, he discerns all of these things. He himself, he's not able to be understood by others. Well, who's, who has been the one to instruct God to do it this way? Well, we have the mind of Christ, or we have the, a mind of, the, uh, of a spiritual capability to be able to discern these things. Therefore, we're with Christ, and we're built up in the Lord. But then, sad to say, there's another response to the matter of combining spiritual things with spiritual work. And that response is found in the third chapter in verses 1 through 3. And I, brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto the spiritual one. You'll notice now he's speaking to those that call brethren, those that are saved. But I have to speak unto you as unto carnal, fleshly ones, even as unto babes in Christ. And this is the problem. I fed you with men. And not with me. I've had to give you the body. I had to give you just the basics and not the diet that I wanted to give you. He says, This is the reason why. For hitherto you were not able to take it, neither yet now are you able. My sin with a broken heart. For your fleshly, or whereas there's among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal? And this last, these last four words, strike home, strike home as no other passage does to me. And you're walking <coughs> as men. Your manner of life, and a logic lesson with screwdriver. Why is the screwdriver? Because it does the work of screw. It isn't kitty cat. It isn't chicken. And it isn't a cow. It's a screw. Person is known by his tool. By his wall. Could it be, folks? You know I love it. It's been a number of times. And yet, I'm so virtuous. It's going on more and more this way. <laughs> Folks, how long have you been saved? 
Um, are you able to get into the word? Does just the word and the preciousness of the Lord and the word encourage you? Or do you find that a constant declaration of simply John 3.16 and praise the Lord for John 3.16 and everyone will say bye. But I'll tell you, after about five or ten years of John 3.16, you want to be on the part of Because simply, John 3.16, as precious as it is to make you a new person in Christ, although that you can elaborate so much on it, if you get into it, it won't make you grow like you should. I know of a church with 11,000 members. Lyle and I visited that church in our seminary day. Two of the couples, and we walked inside of that church. Those two couples, those three couples of us, each one of us had a Bible. And it's a Bible, it's a church that would hold the John 3.16 as much as you and I would hold the John 3.16 and everything else about it. And everyone turned and looked. Who are these folks in the world? You walk as men, you walk as saints. All the warnings that come to us in Hebrews. Folks, the inspired method, we combine spiritual truths with spiritual words and the response <coughs> of such a ministry. on the spiritual condition of that person. He may not be born in you. He may be one thirds revenant spiritual one. Or it may be one, yes, I like a little of it. Listen, I want to live out there. I want to live as man. I want to walk this man. And of course you have. Then the disruption of the revelation of God. Dear one from the bottom of Christ, I sincerely urge that you encourage each other in him. That you be careful the way you handle the book. But be far more careful with how you respond to it. Because the way you respond to it, even this morning, is telling your heart just what kind of spiritual condition you may be Or you might be a spiritual one. Or you may be caught. Not a gift. A meaning for And as a result, your life decays. There's no difference between me and whoever I'm shoulders with. Wherever I work, Right road, whatever I do. Thought grant to you. We get back to the inspired man. <clears throat> so that there might be proper response of leading people to Christ, rescuing the wayward brother and sister. Now our Father, as 
to prepare to study your word. May the ministry of the Spirit of God upon our lives be picked for us this morning. A spiritual condition in the relationship to it. If there's a need that needs to be cared for, our gracious Lord, supply that need in just the way you can and the preciousness and the sweetness of it. If there should be one who's never known the joy of trusting in Jesus, the one who died, shed his precious blood, buried, wonderfully raised again, count, may that one trust him. To the dear wayward brother or sister, may that dear one find the precious and sweet restored touch of us. To the be those that long after the building one from the heart of one. In any response, glorify yourself. In Jesus' name. Now this evening, we would like for you to take your Bibles and turn together to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Now, throughout the week, Lord willing, we would like very much to deal with the five warning passages which occur in the book of Hebrews. Now these passages can uh, be taken out of context and create a great deal of difficulty. I trust that we'll not be doing that this week, but we will try to give you a bit of a running commentary <coughs> concerning the book of Hebrews, whereby the warning passages will be interpreted in the light of the context, at the same time bringing application with reference to their significance in the day in which we also live. Now, first of all, I'd like to bring to your attention just a few of uh, the introductory remarks concerning the book of Hebrews, which I believe to be most vital if we're going to be able to follow along more accurately in our study together. <clears throat> Now, first of all, who are the recipients of this epistle entitled the Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews? Now, we are not too uh, uh, much concerned with reference to the difficulty as to the human authorship. That is very little significance as far as I am concerned to get bogged down in a conference such as ours with reference to authorship. As far as I'm concerned, it is an inspired portion of the Word of God. It is God-breathed. It is that message from the heart of God uh, with reference to His purpose for the recipients of the letter and also His purpose for us today in light of the revelation of this book. It is certainly one that's inspired of God. And there's all of the earmarks of the authenticity and uh, authority that God wants us to have concerning his marvelous heart's message contained in these 13 chapters. Now the recipients of the letter is just exactly as that which is to, to which it is entitled the Hebrew. Now they are Jewish people, is that not right? In other words, here's a letter or here's a message from the heart of God directed specifically to those who belong to the Jewish people. Now, as far as the Jewish people are concerned, you wend your way through this particular book, and you find that there are those that are professing Judaism, those who are, in a real sense, loyal to the Judaistic philosophy of their own religion, as far as the Old Testament is concerned, and those who undoubtedly have been exposed to the person of Jesus Christ as Messiah, and in some cases, undoubtedly, they're professing that Christ is their Messiah. There are a number of difficulties which arise because there are those who are invited to go on into Christ and etc., which we'll be dealing as far, with as far as the warning passages are concerned. Now, again, they're a very religious group. 
not uh, directed to the Gentiles as far as Gentile paganism is concerned, to the group of people that have a religious background steeped in Old Testament revelation. It's also a book that brings to our attention a series of contrasts that in one over another that which may be superior to something that uh, the writer desires us to compare with attention and emphasis. And, uh, of course, we have before us now the matter of the superiority of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as to his person and his work to that which is revealed in the Old Testament. By way of a convenient outline, nothing elaborate, you might divide the book of Hebrews into two major sections. Chapter 1 through chapter 1018 would be a section which deals with doctrine, if you please, concerning the superiority of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work in light of the Old Testament. Then when you come to chapter 10, verse 19, to the end of the 13th chapter, you uh, pass from doctrine, although there's a great deal of doctrine involved in the remaining few chapters, but more or less, now it's the duty of one who is aligned to the doctrine that is revealed in the first uh, ten chapters, roughly speaking. So it's just simply the person of Christ and then the pathway in light of it, or doctrine and duty. Uh, and uh, it uh, unfolds in a very convenient manner this way. Now I'd like to give you, more or less, the passages which deal with the warnings in this book, there are five of them. And just to help us uh, have somewhat of a homiletical outline, which enables us to hang our hat uh, a little more conveniently with reference to this revelation, we have endeavored to give uh, these warning passages a title. And they deal with certain dangers. And so the first uh, warning passage is found in chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4, the danger of drifting. The danger of drifting. This is the first warning passage. The danger of drifting. Then the second warning passage is found in chapter 3, verse 7 through 4.13. And we've entitled this, the danger of disobedience. The danger of disobedience. Then the third warning passage is found in that classic a chapter which is somewhat difficult to understand by way of interpretation, and it begins in chapter 5, verse 11, through chapter 6, verse 20. That's 5, 11 through 6, 20, and the warning here relates to the danger of degeneration. The danger of degeneration. And I imagine many of you, at least those of you who have done any type of Bible study at all, have spent many hours with reference to the sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews. Well, we have two. Now, I, uh, I do not intend to stand before you in this little conference and suggest that by any means I have the final answer to any and every problem that comes up in these warning passages. But I'd simply like to share with you the preciousness of that which the Lord has given to us. And so, this is the third warning passage, the danger of degeneration in chapter 5, 11 through 6, 20. Now the fourth warning passage is found in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 26 to 31. And here you have the danger of disapproval. The danger of disapproval. <clears throat> then the fifth warning passage is found in the 12th chapter, Hebrews 12, 25 through 29, the danger of destruction. The danger of destruction. Now, perhaps you haven't uh, gotten all of those down and you want to get them a little later, well, that'll be fine. But we will be giving our attention to these major warning passages beginning tomorrow evening. Now, tonight, I'd like to give you the theme of the book of Hebrews and the introduction, which I believe acts as a significant and important basis for us to understand the warning passages. Now, the passage which deals with the theme of the book of Hebrews is very easy and simple to find. It is simply the first three verses of the first chapter. These three verses of uh, the first chapter of Hebrews gives to us or introduce to us the key 
or the theme of the entire book. And I'd like to read it for you and then give you a bit of an outline as we uh, give our attention to the theme this evening. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, <clears throat> as far as the theme is concerned, you're dealing with the preeminence or the superiority, the superiority of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, when you say the superiority of his person and his work, you have to bring something up to show where about that which is superior over. And so it is just simply this. The superiority of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his word in contrast to the Old Testament revelation and the ministry in the Old Testament. Now, as far as these three verses are concerned, you find the superiority in a twofold manner. First of all, in verse 1 through the first part of 2, or you have verse 1 through 2a, the superior revealing, or the superior revelation, to put it that way. And then verse 2b through 3, the superior revealing. So you have a superior revelation and a superior revealer brought before it. Now notice the superior revelation. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now I don't know what has been your attitude when you come to the work of the Lord. Nor do I know what has been your understanding with reference to the book of Hebrews. But when I come to this first verse, and I come to the first word, God. Now I'm dealing with a book that demands my heart's devotion and attention. Because the very first word introduces me to a person. And that person isn't like anyone else. That person's not like you, and that person's not like me. That person is one that is. We were those who lived in Old Testament days. We would immediately bow in awe, reverence, and devotion. And isn't it strange, when we come to a book in the New Testament, which sets before us superiority over that of the Old Testament, the day in which we live, Christendom as a whole has become so cold and so callous. That to name the name of God is simply taking a name very lightly. It doesn't cause us. You just check. It doesn't cause Christendom to come to a condition of a holy hush. Evangelical Christendom has rebelled, rightfully so, against a pious, idolatrous, mystical, liturgical religion. 
which is <coughs> which is couched in piety, suggesting that that piety is true reverence and worship. And so Protestantism has rebelled and revolted against that, rightfully so. But in that revolt, and in that rebellion, against that godless, ungodly method of so-called Christendom, we likewise have become flagrantly guilty of impiety. We have become brazen. We've become brass. And we suppose that in light of being evangelicals and having the truth, and I am firmly convinced we do, that this puts us on a pedestal unconsciously that we do not have to show it. Respect because we're superior to others. And I have come to the conclusion that many times you're absolutely right, but being right, you're absolutely wrong. And this is one of the areas. So, folks, listen. I don't know how you're going to approach you. Dude. But I'll tell you, we better approach it from the reality of how it begins. And that is, as we're instructed and invited in the 10th chapter, therefore let us come boldly right in to the very holy of holies, because through the rent veil of the body of Christ, we have an invitation into the very presence of Almighty God. And I'll tell you, starting out the book of Hebrews like this meant something to the recipients of this letter. Because when it came to the privilege and the opportunity of anyone going into the Holy of Holies, where God dwelt into the presence of God, only one person could go in there once a year, and I will tell you, he could only go the right way. And he didn't come brazenly, he didn't come brassy, he didn't come in pride, he didn't come in any other way. But he came in in reverence and awe with that vessel contained blood. Because he was coming into the presence of his holiness. God forbid that we should come to the book of Hebrews with any thought that we could instruct or that we could plumb death or any of this attitude. Absolutely not. We come to the book of Hebrews realizing that we start in the very presence of deity. And may this, may this surround every meeting of ours in the consciousness of whose presence we come. Well, what about him? We have set before us now in comparison as a contrast. What God has done. We have two time periods. We have in verse 1 what God did in times past. We have in verse 2 what God is doing now. What did he do in times past? Oh, holy God, revealed. He unveiled his own dear revelation in sundry times in many manners. 
in in and diverse manners he spoke, he revealed in times past, in the past, unto the fathers, unto the Jewish leaders, unto the Jewish nation, by his chosen vessels, the prophets. And all how the recipients of this letter who were the Jews would immediately say, Amen. For you remember the second and the third chapter of the book of Romans. How that God had entrusted the very living, living oracles along with Romans chapter 10. The very word of God. The revelation from glory unto the Jewish people to impart. They were to be a living epistle. They were to be a witness.